Today I would like to share our data on how we use our favorite model organism, and that is the zebrafish, to study angiogenesis. And I would like to touch upon four different subjects during my talk. First, just a brief introduction into blood vessels, as I think everybody in the audience knows what they are important for. And then zebrafish and why we use zebrafish. And then I would like to share some of our data, how different vascular beds are controlled by distinct mechanisms, both genetics and uh, also hemodynamics. And then later on, uh, I would like to talk about our recent data where we try to find out how also variability arises in the vascular system because yeah, everybody's vascular system looks different, but still it works in every person. So how is this functionality ensured that the variability is kept within certain borders? So blood vessels have obvious important functions. They are necessary for the growth of the tissue and maintenance, uh, but also here, for example, for organ homeostasis, as hormones are transported via the blood, also components of the immune system uh, are uh, transported there. But interestingly, also blood vessels have been shown that during embryonic development that they can have inductive um, properties. So the formation of new blood vessels is classically divided into two uh, major processes. So the de novo one is called vascular genesis, where a blood vessel forms at a, a region where there was no blood vessel before, and um, angiogenesis. And this is, you already have a blood vessel, and now you have sprouting of new blood vessels from this pre-existing one. And I will mainly focus here on the uh, aspect of angiogenesis in the remainder of my talk. Of course, both processes are very extensive in the developing embryo because you have to vascularize every tissue. And uh, in contrast to this, in adults, this is very limited. There are some exceptions. And if it occurs in the adult, it is usually associated with pathological situations. We all know uh, tumor progression, and we try to block angiogenesis to uh, improve the uh, progression here, but also wound healing and collateral vessel formation. And therefore, many diseases have a central vascular component. And what has become clear over the recent years is that the key molecules and processes that uh, control angiogenesis in the embryo, they are pretty well conserved uh, among species, but also between adults and the embryos. So basically, you, you often get reactivation of the embryonic angiogenesis program in those pathological situations. So we are trying to understand how the angiogenesis happens in embryos. The model we use is the zebrafish because it has some key advantages. It has a very rapid external development, and um, I will show uh, what it means to uh, have rapid development. But I think I also want to stress the point here that it's externally, because uh, I heard this morning about uh, how you operate on the heart of mice. So uh, also with the embryo, it develops inside the mother, so you cannot image it. You cannot easily do manipulations. But the fish is in the water. It's transparent, so you can really beautifully film how the vessels form, and you can also transplant cells here. Then we have forward and reverse genetic approaches. So you can screen, you can induce mutations in, in random genes, and then look for the phenotype, and if there's a vascular phenotype. But now we can also do reverse genetic approaches. We can, for example, inject here these antisense oligonucleotides directly into the egg to block gene function, so the translation of a gene. But now we also have a new technology that I will explain, and this is using zinc finger nucleases. And I will come back to this later. So this is a reverse genetics approach where you can start out with the gene and then ask what is the function of this gene. And of course, you can produce transgenic zebrafish, and this then makes you uh, able to visualize the developing vascular system because you can express fluorescent proteins in the endothelial cells that line the blood vessels. So rapid embryonic development, and I think uh, for everybody who works with a, a mouse, you ask yourself what happens in the first 48 hours in the mouse. Um, well, if you have one egg here of the zebrafish, within uh, 30 hours, you already have this animal here that really looks like a fish and has a beating heart, and also the blood here is pumped uh, through the embryo, and you have an established circulatory loop. So it's extremely rapid, and of course, this is very convenient uh, for screening factors that might influence angiogenesis. How do we visualize the blood vessels? 
uh, we have several technologies. You can do angiography, so you inject fluorescent dyes directly into the circulation, and then all the lumen of the uh, blood vessels slide up, and you can, I think, see that this is the fish here with the head, and you can see these beautiful intersomitic vessels. And also we have these transgenic fish where you express, for example, GFP here in all endothelial cells. And of course, you can combine both technologies and then have a different color here labeling the lumen and then the uh, GFP, for example, labeling the uh, cytoplasm of the endothelial cells. And uh, now I would like to introduce um, the genetic factors that form these intersomitic vessels here that develop in the trunk of the zebrafish embryo. And I will introduce um, two very important genetic factors um, that have been identified over the last couple of years to be important for embryonic and eugenesis. And the one is this uh, VEGF signaling, which stands for vascular endothelial growth factor. And it's basically a tyrosine kinase receptor signaling where you have uh, ligand, VEGFA, but there are also other ones, that binds to a receptor and then via downstream signaling, it um, elicits uh, target gene transcription and controls angiogenesis. And if you have mutants in one of these components, what you can see here, if you compare these intersomitic vessels of the wild type with the ones in the mutants, you can see that you have uh, variable effects, but you always have a defect in the proper formation here of these sprouts of the angiogenic sprout. And in addition, what you also have is that you have loss of arterial marker gene expression. So here you see FMD2. The name doesn't matter, but this is exclusively expressed here in this artery from which these sprouts form. And you lose this expression in the VEGF mutants. So VEGF is really a key component that controls the morphogenesis and also the gene expression pattern in these endothelial cells in the embryo. The other pathway that has been shown to be important is a very different pathway. It's a notch signaling pathway. And this um, pathway here consists also of a ligand and a receptor. But these are thought to be on adjacent cells. So while VEGF is a secreted protein, notch signaling really requires direct physical contact of adjacent cells. And this contact then leads to um, binding here of the receptor of the ligands here to the receptor. You have uh, proteolytic cleavages. And this releases the so-called notch intracellular domain. This is directly then translocated into the nucleus where it associates with other transcription factors and then here elicits target gene transcription. And interestingly, components of the notch signaling pathway, both the ligands here, like delta like 4, or the receptor, for example, here notch 1b, they are specifically expressed here in this dorsal aorta from which these intersomitic vessels sprout. In contrast to mutants in the VEGF receptor signaling pathway, mutants now uh, for the notch signaling pathway, they show the exact opposite phenotype. So VEGF mutants had no sprouting. Now if you have mutants in the notch signaling pathway, what we observe now you have too much angiogenesis happening here. And of interest, this uh, excess angiogenesis, this is also accompanied by a drastic increase in endothelial cell numbers in these intersomitic sprouts. So instead of three or four cells, now you have twice as many sprouts here. And it's also been shown that the angiogenic behavior, uh, which uh, is characterized here by filopodial extensions from these endothelial cells, that this is also increased if you don't have proper notch signaling. So these opposing phenotypes they have led to a model by which VEGF and notch signaling interact. And this is summarized here in this slide. So the idea is that you would have VEGF signaling here that via its receptor um, initiates the transcription of uh, notch pathway components, for example, delta like 4. These then bind on uh, notch receptors on the neighboring cell. And this then leads to the downregulation of VEGF receptors. For example, here, uh, this VEGF receptor KDR, and also to the upregulation of another VEGF receptor, which is called FLIT1. And here you have to know that in embryo development, FLIT1 is um, thought to be a negative regulator of angiogenesis. So if you don't have FLIT1, you have too much angiogenesis. So notch signaling 
really um, acts on these uh, VEGF receptors. So this was uh, the first part where I introduced these two key signaling components, the genetic factors VEGF and, uh, and uh, how they control segmental artery formation. And we then asked, uh, do other uh, genetic signals play a role, or is, is this um, in every vascular bed the two major players? And in order to understand this, we analyzed the formation of the first aorta in the embryo, the so-called um, lateral dorsal aorta. And um, this also, in mouse uh, later on, you have an anterior region, which, which is uh, bifurcated. And then in the posterior part of the embryo, you have uh, only a single dorsal aorta here. And we wondered, how does this, let's say, Y-shaped structure form during embryogenesis? And in order to do this, what we can do in the fish is we can perform time-lapse imaging where we take the embryo and film all the endothelial cells and how they migrate. I would like to show you such a time-lapse movie here. So the gray thing here is the yolk ball. And in this embryo uh, is a transgenic embryo. All the endothelial cells are labeled with GFP. So here you can see them in white. And uh, I have also uh, to say that um, this GFP is not only in endothelial cells, but it's also expressed here in some endodermal tissue and also here in some neuronal tissue. But what you will see is how the endothelial cells that make this first lateral dorsal aorta, how they migrate and uh, how they uh, come together. So they start here from this anterior part and then they migrate posteriorly and then they, may, uh, they meet this posterior uh, vessel here that, that comes from this region. And interestingly, you have a similar way of uh, formation of this so-called primary hindbrain channel, which is the first major head vein. So both the first major artery and the first major vein, they derive from endothelial cells in very different anatomical locations. So from endothelial cells that are located here in the anterior part and from endothelial cells located in the posterior part. And then they migrate towards each other and then they fuse. And this is uh, just here in the still images, also illustrated here in um, these pictures. So this was very interesting to us to note because we asked then ourselves, so they come from different regions, they migrate in a different way, do they also express different genes? And the short answer to this is yes, and uh, we'll show you the, the genes that we identified. So if we now look here from the top onto this developing embryo, um, we labeled all endothelial cells with this VEGF receptor 2, which is also called KDR. And here would be the head now. And so you can see here these anterior aorta, and here the posterior ones before they have fused. And then we checked um, for other genes, and one is a chemokine receptor. I will explain it later. It's called CXTF4A. And what we find that this chemokine receptor is exclusively expressed here in this anterior population, but not in the posterior one. And this is still true also at later stages, where you can see CXTF4A expression here in the anterior, uh, but not in the posterior. And we also showed this with a double fluorescent in situ, where we can detect two RNAs simultaneously. This is now a lateral view. And again, CXTF4A is only expressed in this anterior vessel. So we have a blood vessel, the major blood vessel aorta, is made up of cells that, that are genetically different, but still uh, they are fused. So what is this CXCF4A? CXCF4A is a chemokine receptor, and these are G-protein coupled transmembrane receptors that have been first um, analyzed and studied in their role in the trafficking of immune cells, but they have been found to guide cell migration in various contexts, uh, also in the embryo. For example, neuronal migration, germ cells, or in the zebrafish, there is a sensory organ, the lateral line, and this migration of the lateral line organ also heavily relies on the chemokines. And I would like to, and, and there are like 50 or so um, chemokines, but I would like to focus here on this uh, CXCR4A receptor. And it also has a ligand, which is now called CXCR12B. And uh, before it was called SDF1, for people that uh, might remember the old nomenclature. So now we have analyzed that this um, gene is expressed in a certain subset of endothelial cells. And before I told you, we only could 
perform forward genetics, where we went from a phenotype to the gene, and now we wanted to go from the gene and see what is the phenotype of the mutant here. And uh, we turned to a new strategy that was developed actually in the neighboring lab at the University of Massachusetts Medical School by uh, Scott Wolf. And these are so-called zinc finger nucleases. And zinc finger nucleases um, is very exciting because they are basically designer restriction enzymes. So they consist of uh, two parts. And that is the zinc finger part that confers the DNA specificity and then also a nuclease. And if they heterodimerize like this on a stretch of DNA, then uh, the nucleases can cut the DNA. You get a double-strand break. And this is then repaired, but in an error-prone way. So we designed zinc finger nucleases for this CXCF4A. And we were actually able to establish mutants for this gene. And we also made the same here for the CXCL12B ligand. So we have uh, two mutants here for CXCL4A and one uh, for its ligand, the uh, CXCL12. And then we asked, what is the phenotype of these mutants now? And especially now, that, because we knew that it's expressed in this lateral dorsal aorta, we focused on the development of the lateral dorsal aorta. And here's a wild type embryo. So here the yellow box is this, this lateral dorsal aorta here. Here would be this primary hindbrain channel again. And in the red box, there are again these intersemitic vessels that I talked about that heavily depend on VEGF and MOSH signaling. And the interesting thing that we observed was that there was a very specific defect here in the development of the lateral dorsal aorta. So also um, made a movie that I'm not re, uh, that I'm not going to show, but you can see in the movie that these anterior cells, they don't migrate posteriorly anymore, but they go to random positions in the embryo, and uh, you get these characteristic gaps here in the lateral dorsal aorta. But what is also very interesting is that these intersomitic vessels, they look exactly like in the wild type. So CXC4A seems to be specifically required for the formation of this first aorta, but not uh, for the intersomitic vessels. To summarize, our timeless analysis showed that here this first aorta in the embryo is comprised of endothelial cells from different origins in the embryo. You have anterior ones and posterior ones, and that they also show distinct migratory behaviors, and that we could identify genes that are specifically expressed only in the anterior or in the posterior region of this dorsal aorta, and that this expression of these genes is very important for the proper formation here of the structure. Because if you have mutants here for CX here for A, for example, you still have these migrating posterior cells, but the anterior ones don't make it anymore and they cannot fuse. So I introduced three different genetic pathways that are important for angiogenesis in different regions of the embryo the notch VEGF signal for segmental arteries, and uh, the CXCF4A that is important for lateral dorsal aorta formation. However, this is in the early embryos, where every embryo looks the same. And the interesting thing is now, if um, we look later, um, we see differences, which is in contrast to this uh, hardwired um, situation in the early embryo. And we were now wondering, how do these um, differences look like? And um, how is it controlled that they are not too big? And uh, the interesting thing is that these differences also have um, certain application. And I looked it up on the internet. So now there's this uh, vascular biometrics, where you screen, for example, the veins on the back of your hands. And they are different in every person. And then instead of taking your fingerprint, uh, you can open the door here uh, with this uh, Venus pattern here that is unique uh, to you. And of course, the question is, why are there differences? Why isn't it hardwired like in the early embryo? Um, and uh, the more important question is, of course, how do you set the borders? Because if the differences are too big, something, the tissue doesn't get enough uh, oxygen anymore. And uh, you have to make sure that even though there are differences, uh, you still have a fully functional vascular system. And we think that uh, now, in addition to the genetic factors, we have uh, this hemodynamic stimulus, a physiological stimulus, uh, the blood flow that controls um, that the vasculature 
is forming uh, fu uh, in a functionally proper way. And uh, the work was done here by a talented postdoc in the lab, uh, Jimmy Busman, and he analyzed the first forming brain blood vessels, the so-called central arteries. Because these are the first vessels that where you can detect differences among individual embryos. And uh, unfortunately, yeah, it's a little bit bright, um, but uh, this is an overview picture of the brain blood vessels. This is an angiography, and this is a three-dimensional structure. So um, yeah, it's not so easy to see, but I will highlight certain key vessels that will be important for uh, the rest of my talk. And these key vessels are this primary hindbrain channel that I already talked about, which is located here uh, laterally, and the basal artery, oh yeah, that's in the middle, and the central arteries, which are these arteries here that connect the basal artery with the primary hindbrain channel. And I think this becomes a little bit easier to see when we rotate the whole thing. So these uh, central arteries here are basically arch-shaped connections from the basal artery in the middle to the primordial hindbrain channel. And now I take away the rest of the vessels and uh, turn this uh, wire diagram around and I think you can appreciate uh, the three-dimensionality. So these first brain blood vessels have the centrally located artery that is connected by these arches to two laterally located veins. And again, we wanted to understand how does this structure form now in the embryo. We could uh, perform time-lapse analysis because in the fish uh, uh, it's very easy to do. And here now you can see the formation of the first brain blood vessels in a transgenic line that expresses a membrane-bound RFP. And we look now from the top onto the brain. And this is here one primary hindbrain channel, and this is the other. And you see there's not a central, uh, a basilar artery yet, but this will form if I run the movie. And I think you can appreciate that you have a lot of filopolial extensions here coming out from these cells and that they are highly motile. And basically you have two waves of angiogenesis. One forms this basilar artery here in the middle, and then you have the second wave of angiogenesis uh, where you have these arches sprouting that form these central arteries. And they would basically sprout out of the plane of the screen here. In order to illustrate this a little bit better, again, I have some still images here, where here first you have this, the ventral formation of this basal artery, and then you have the sprouting of the central arteries, which then form these arches and connect now this arterial vessel here to uh, the veins, the primary hindbrain channels. And I said we see uh, that there are differences. So uh, here, again, this is still images of these vessels, and when Giroud now compared different embryos, what he saw is that um, you have these uh, primary hindbrain channels, and uh, the position and the number of these central artery sprouts, they are the same in every embryo. However, the number and position of interconnections among them, this differs, and also here, the position of the connections to the basilar artery, except these four fixed positions. So really, for the first time, uh, there is uh, a variability, and just uh, according to the vascular pattern, you can now identify uh, different embryos. So we wanted to understand if our genetic signaling pathways that I've introduced play a role here in the patterning of the brain vasculature. And so we analyzed uh, VEGF mutants, and we see that VEGF is required for both angiogenic steps. So without VEGF, you don't have a basal artery and you don't have any central arteries that form. And interestingly, without notch signaling, we also have this overgrowth of the vasculature in the brain. And this uh, shows that both pathways are conserved uh, between these intersomitic vessels and the blood vessels in the brain. And uh, coming back here to, to the slide uh, that I showed you before, where VEGF um, via notch then leads to the uh, upregulation uh, of this uh, FLIT1, the negative uh, receptor. Uh, we then also looked for uh, the genetic uh, pathways here, and we can see that in the mutant here that doesn't have VEGF signaling, both the notch signaling is not turned on and also the downstream signaling component, FLIT1, is not expressed. 
And in contrast, of course, now, if we reduce um, here notch signaling uh, with this DL4 morpholino injection, we see that we have less notch and less of this downstream factor FLIT1. So both the morphology and um, the gene expression patterns, uh, this is uh, a batch of a notch. This is conserved during trunk and brain angiogenesis. How about now this chemokine receptor CXCA4A that I showed you the mutant has here this phenotype in the formation of the lateral dorsal aorta. When we check for the expression of CXCA4A, it was very interesting for us to see that we can find CXCA4A expression exclusively here in these sprouting central arteries. So it's not expressed in the primary hindbrain channel from which these central arteries uh, sprout, but it's really in these tip cells, the first cells that migrate out. And this makes sense if you look at the expression of the ligand for this chemokine receptor, the CXCA12B. Here is this basilar artery that forms in the middle of the brain. And now if we see uh, the expression here of CXCA12B in red, we can see that this ligand is expressed right above this basilar artery. And uh, this is a three-dimensional representation. So you can nicely see this midline expression of CXCL12B and exactly at the position to which these sprouting central arteries need to migrate. So this really makes sense. What is now the phenotype of the mutant? So again, from this expression in these first central artery sprouts, we would expect that in the mutant, these central arteries are specifically affected. So here they are shown in a wild type, and you can see they, they have a lumen and connect here to this basilar artery in the middle. And now in the mutant, uh, there's a very distinct phenotype, and that is that you have the first sprouting here of these central arteries happening, but then they get stuck. So they cannot make the full arch, and they cannot connect here to this basilar artery in the middle. So and uh, Jeroen then um, analyzed uh, the phenotype in more detail. And uh, what he basically found is that, uh, yeah, as I said, here in the wild type, you have this ventral connection. And this cannot happen in the mutant anymore. However, the interesting thing was that now you have more interconnections here between the central arteries and fewer connections here to the basilar artery. And uh, down here are the quantifications for this. So a decrease in the number of primal hindbrain channel to basilar artery connections, the yellow dots um, decrease, and an increase in these interconnections. So why is this happening? Again, we looked in the time-lapse movies here. Uh, you've seen the wild type. And um, when you see that the central artery sprout, there is one very interesting time point, And that is when they go from this angiogenic um, a state where they have this philopodia to the state where they have connected to the basilar artery because then they become smooth and then they lose the philopodial extensions and they stop being angiogenic. And if you look now in the CXCA4A mutant, for example, this doesn't happen. So the cells, they remain angiogenic and they still have the philopodia because they can never connect here to this artery and they can never receive arterial input. And uh, we observe the same thing happening also in wild type embryos. So for example, here you see a sprout that has connected to this basilar artery, and then it becomes smooth and it has a lumen, while for example, here these two sprouts, they have interconnected. But despite this, they, they remain angiogenic, and they don't uh, become smooth and stop with their angiogenic program. And this is shown here also in this movie which has a higher frame rate. And I think you can appreciate that it is a very dramatic event for an endothelial cell uh, from being angiogenic to having connected here to this uh, target blood vessel, the artery, and then it becomes luminized and very smooth and it stops with its angiogenesis. And we think that this is due to, to the perfusion and to the shear stress that is now on the endothelial cells, that this really changes the morphology and uh, what we think also uh, gene expression programs. So if we look, as I said here, this morphology is very different between the wild type and the mutant. 
And now if we look at gene expression patterns, we also find distinct changes. And the most dramatic is in the expression of this chemokine receptor CXCR4A itself, uh, <clears throat> which at this stage is basically downregulated in most of these uh, central artery cells in the wild type. However, in the mutant, it is still highly expressed. And we now wondered uh, why this happens. Is it because it's a feedback loop uh, between uh, the receptor and, and its own signaling? Or is it maybe uh, that here this perfusion event has an effect on the gene expression? And we got first hints uh, from um, here these ligand mutants, because what happens in these mutants sometimes is that uh, one side of the brain can actually be perfused. So this is an angiography uh, that shows that you have perfused blood vessels, because here you can see one connection to the basilar artery. And on the other side of the brain, even though there are endothelial cells there, because here you can see the green endothelial cells, they're not perfused. And then what we often see is that CXC4A expression is still high on the unperfused side, but it is downregulated um, on the side that has received perfusion, which again indicates that this event of the perfusion of a vessel, this leads to the rapid downregulation of this CXC4A. We can also modify perfusion or heart rate uh, with drugs. And one is called tricam, which, uh, which is an anesthetic uh, that we use in fish. And um, already a treatment for one hour with uh, sublethal dose, so the heart is still beating with this tricam drug, this already leads to a drastic increase in the CXCR4A expression in endothelial cells. So we believe that um, this physiological uh, hemodynamic stimulus having flow, that this feeds back here on the expression of our chemokine receptor CXCR4A. And of course now, why is this important? And this brings me then to uh, already here the summary of the brain blood vessels. So initially, you have uh, the sprouting here from the primordial hindbrain channel of this first angiogenic wave that forms the basilar artery which is dependent here on VEGF and KDR signaling, as I've shown you. And then subsequently, also VEGF and KDR uh, signaling is important here for the sprouting of these uh, central arteries and also for the expression of uh, notch pathway components in these vessels and also CXCR4A expression. The ligand is expressed here in the midline um, underneath the basilar artery. And now we have sprouting of these central arteries towards the midline. And up to here, every embryo looks the same. And now this is the, the critical point, because now two things can happen. So either you have a direct connection now here of the central artery to the basilar artery. And of course, this has blood flow, which can go into this vessel and close this circulatory loop from the artery to the vein. And then CXCR4A becomes downregulated. You have a mature vessel, and um, you know everything is as it should be. However, you can also have here this interconnection between these two sprouts. And I think if you go through the reviews, this is called anastomosis. This is often referred to as the point when angiogenesis stops. But of course, in our situation, this would have dire consequences because every time if you have this, this interconnection here, you would basically have a closed venous loop without any input from the arterial circulation. And also, we don't see that angiogenesis stops. But angiogenesis continues until now you have connection here to the basilar artery. And angiogenesis continuing here means also that you keep CXCR4A expression high. So you keep the expression of the component that uh, guides you to this artery here high until you have connected to the artery. And I think this is how the diversity or how the variability arises in these brain blood vessels, but also how the, the borders are kept in such a way that you always make sure uh, that at some point you have here this input from the arterial circulation and that you can close here this arterial uh, venous loop. So we like to put here flow in addition to genetic components as, as key regulatory factor in uh, determining CXCR4A expression at later stages of embryonic development. So to summarize, 
I showed you our work on how VEGF and notch signaling determine the formation here of the segmental arteries in the trunk and uh, how this chemokine receptor CXCA4A is important in the formation of this first forming aorta in the embryo. And um, towards the end, I touched upon the brain blood vessels, how these three genetic factors are cooperating in the formation of the vessels in the head, and then how this feedback loop via the hemodynamics and this physiological stimulus helps in uh, patterning and uh, ensuring functionality of these later developing blood vessels. And uh, with this, I come to uh, my acknowledgments. Uh, a lot of the work has still been done here in uh, Nathan Lawson's lab, uh, UMass Medical School in Worcester. Um, and um, I talked about here the work of Jeroen Busman, uh, who started in my lab about a year and a half ago. And here are people from uh, the UMass Imaging Facility and Scott Wolf, who has been very helpful with uh, designing the zinc finger nucleases. And I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions.